on this computer. Okay, should be going. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emily Robertson from Robertson at IS Gallery. We're doing something a little bit different today. We're having a meeting to interview our photographer, John Setter, and this time it's going to be recorded. So, John, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, okay, everybody. My name is John Setter, and I'm a fine art photographer that lives in Sydney, Australia, originally from Detroit, Michigan, and been doing it for about four and a half years now. Graduated from my master's program about a year and a half ago now, and just trying to figure it all out in this coronavirus world and how to keep making work. <laughs> yeah. When did you actually decide to move to Sydney? Because right now for me, it's 6 p.m. I'm having a glass of wine, it's cocktail hour. Uh, but for you, it's eight in the morning. You're living a really, it's Saturday, you're in the future. Yeah, I'm in the future. I have a coffee instead of a wine and it's eight in the morning here. So uh, I moved here about six years ago with my partner because he lives here. So yeah, so that's the real reason I came. Do you miss when the you snow? Whoop. Sorry, I said, do you miss the snow at all? I do at times. I It's been cold here the last couple of days. I quite liked it though. It's not like snowing, but it's cold and it's kind of nice. I always like going back. Like it was nice seeing you guys in Montreal last year because it was snow and it was freezing and I kind of enjoyed it. And it was like, what, minus like 10 degrees or something. It was cold when you came. I feel like we had a Christmas party when you came. Yeah, you did. Yeah, it was really nice. Like I, it felt very East Coast, uh, America, <laughs> Canada. I loved it. Pizza party will do that for you. So yeah. tell us a little bit how you got, because I'm a huge fan of, minimalism i i love the simplicity i think that it's a it's an amazing lifestyle it's a great way of creating art to really bringing it down to to the basics and creating something um just jaw dropping in just a few color combos or line works how did you get into minimalism uh i think it was sort of by accident i first of all, accidentally fell into photography. And then from there, I think just the way I saw the world, I slowly come decompressed it and like made it more simple as I learned photography. Yeah. I, cause originally I was more interested in painting and stuff. And then by uh, coming here and looking at the landscape and trying to get to know my new country and home, I think I used the camera as a way to figure it out. And then I guess I just slowly was trying to be slightly different than everyone else. And so it slowly became more and more minimal and got rid of everything that was in the way and distracting me and my way of seeing. So I don't know if it was like intentional and then, but now it is. And now I know how I see and I look for these things on the way. Yeah. But originally, I don't think it was. It was it was pretty incredible when on your Instagram stories um, you you were you were showing sort of how the image comes to be and you were showing this this really I don't even remember what it was like some sort of machine and with the sticker patterns and then suddenly like you bring it down and it's like just really sharp color combo that it, if I had seen that object I would have never thought of hey wait we could break this down into red yellow and black and it's going to be amazing like how are you just always your is your radar out for seeing these different types of color combos or do you really seek them out when you go on a day of like i'm gonna find this no i have no intentions when i go out shooting like i hope to see things and it's all my work is really by chance because it has to do with the lighting and the way the shadows are hitting something when i come across it so i originally i was probably looking more for color but now lately i'm trying to also get shots that feel like they're from that place so like the Japanese when you're talking about it's a vending machine it's very Japanese to me and I just happen to see the details within the graphic and then the color of the machine so I'm looking more for that and like the materials and the textures within the place and like how like I can combine them so I'm more on I sort of know what I'm looking for when I'm walking now but you still never know what you can come across it's, so it's still fun but I, I think I know enough how I see that I can like on my periphery is see what's going on and while I'm looking and walking ahead. So, um, but I'm always in the zone, like 
less so when I'm at home, but when I'm out traveling, I'm more like, okay, this is focus time. I, I remember when you came to Montreal, you actually mentioned something that that I actually only realized recently about where where I live is that how often the skies are great. And now it's summertime, so we're blessed with like some blue skies, but for the majority of the year, our skies are just really have no, no color. And and that's something that you mentioned where you're like, oh, there's a lot of photos that would have been really interesting, but I I can't take those photos because your skies are so great. Was that a disappointment when you came to Montreal? No, because I probably knew it. Like, because Europe's the same. It's very hit and miss for me. And I can take other type of photography, but my like my main stuff needs bright sun. I don't need the blue sky. I just really need a lot of sun coming down. And winter in Montreal. And actually, well, we had sun the day I was there walking. It was just so cold. I don't think I shot much. It was just like I was rugged up, and I tried, and my camera was failing, and it was, it was too cold. Camera, the cold kills your camera for sure. Oh yeah, so it was nice and sunny, it just was too cold. Um, but if I was going to come do more work in Montreal, I would definitely do it in the summer when it's more consistent. So I could do like a two week span and get a lot more shots done. Yeah. I will get, Crosswood, do you agree? Agreed. <laughs> um, so I have a question, when you're going on these shoots and you're, you're coming up with like these very sleek combinations, how, how many, is it just like it's a one shot deal where you just snap it and it makes perfect sense? Or are you taking numerous pictures of those same angles to get the perfect shot? Oh, I take yeah numerous shots. Um, my library is full of like, you can see like 10 to 20 of the same one, especially if I find something I really like and I'm like, okay, this is, this feels like a great one. I just, I make sure I get it and I have backups just in case. And then like, cause I'm trying to get the composition as perfect in camera so I'm trying to get the corners lined up to the edge of the viewfinders and stuff so it's like sometimes it's just off so I just then I take another one and another one and oh, and then sometimes if I like an area or like a certain building sometimes I'll try many different angles and so then I have an options when I come home I can edit and figure out what might what might look the best later so. it makes me think a lot about how now with digital photography we have like the permission to to really mess up like I remember I mean as a young adult where you had your you had your film in your in your camera and you better you better not mess it up like you have one shot you're taking that picture of you smiling by the mountain and it be, better be amazing your eyes better be open whereas now like do you think that because well I think you're younger than I am but I, I mean there, there's still like that that sense of of how digital photography has permitted so much more exploration. Do you think that that has impacted your work a lot? Probably a bit. I think I probably over, I probably overtake shots because I, the harder part is coming home and then trying to edit and I have so many choices and that's sometimes tough. Uh, what, when I was researching William Eggleston, the, the famous American photographer, he was famous for saying he only ever took one shot of all of his images and like, cause it was filmed. So I sometimes think like, oh, maybe I should just do that. And this, whatever you get is whatever you get, even with digital. And it's like, it'd be a lot easier in the end, but it's tough to do. Like, we yeah, actually you know, have another, another photographer in our, in our little Zoom meeting. And we have Autumn Woods, or like she's there for, for me. And, and so Autumn, do you think that like for digital photography has that like, are you one of those that takes like a million pictures or do you stick to that one shot? You know, how do you fit with John? I agree with John. Like, um, I remember when I was in school and the photography professor said, you shoot a hundred photos to get one. And that's sort of, I think that, and that was film photography. So I feel like the concept is still the same. Like, I think the bonus is the digital photography. You see exactly what you're going to get. You don't have to wait to go in the dark room and you develop and all of that. But um, I think the concept that John's talking about is still the same, which is like, you take a million shots, but you still have the one shot you're trying to get to. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a process. So John, actually, when you, you said just earlier something that I didn't know about you, you said that you, you were very interested in painting at first. So when you started your master's, was it always to keep going with photography or did that evolve throughout? No, it was all photography the whole time, but like, cause I studied animation for my bachelor's in Detroit. 
And then, so I've always been more interested in that side of things. I didn't really ever think too much about photography. And so I originally took a course in it to get better at using a camera to shoot reference photos. And then uh, as the course got, went on, they like showed more styles of photography and I kind of got interested and I was traveling at the same time more. So I just, and then it just evolved from there. And then when I got into the masters, I had my previous knowledge of painting. And then I, as I learned more about history of photography, I think it kind of meshed together and it sort of helped shape what I'm doing now. So what kind of painter were you? Oh, it was, it was more like entertainment concept. It wasn't like, I like more like Mondrian and Rothko when I look at paintings, but uh, it, yeah, it wasn't like, it wasn't as abstract and like what I'm doing now. But I just think it probably all had an influence subliminally and it just kind of progressed from there because I look at that stuff a lot. Did you say entertainment concept? That's amazing. I'm going to reuse that. I love that expression. Yeah, like concept art. That's what I studied originally. So and I still like to play around with that, but not as much right now. Um, so you actually published a book last year. Yeah. Um, and a book that we do have at the gallery that's that's a beautiful piece of art in itself. Oh, um, I I... Tell us a little bit about that process and how that came to be. Yeah, so this is the book, John Sutter, The Urban Text. Um, yeah, the book happened just after I finished the Masters. I was planning on self-publishing my own collection anyways, just because most photographers I researched, it was all about creating a photo book and a collection that can be a bit hands-on and easy access for people. That was, and even in the digital age, I think people like to have something physical they can touch instead of just scrolling through feeds and such. Uh, but the guy who did our yearbook for the school, he's a, he has his own like publishing house and he liked my work when he made our yearbook. So he contacted me about publishing it. And so we worked for the whole year creating the book. Yeah. It was quite I, a fun process. I really remember on your, on your Instagram and I, and I bring back the Instagram a, a lot because it's actually, it's a really big part of how you, you connect with collectors and with, with potential clients. But I remember on your Instagram, you were showing stories of like, Hey, here are different textures for the covers here. Are the different, And I love being involved. Like I remember voting, like there was a choice between like, uh, uh, sort of the, the beige color that, that the yeah. cover is now or a gray if I remember I, I voted for the other one but I was wrong you you chose the better one but um but I thought that was really fun that you involved people in that process were you doing that intentionally or was it just like hey I wonder what people think yeah I think I've learned that people like to be involved on social media so I think that's just something I'm, yeah I've gotten more Doing that. That's when I'm doing more videos of myself and just asking people questions and it helps sort of with the choice process because sometimes it can be hard and especially when we were down to the wire on that we had to choose for that cover and so I was just like why not throw it out there and see what what other people think just in case you know and then if they had all voted like the opposite of what your gut was saying would you have listened probably not but I don't know it's still good to see you never know it might sway you later on so my the designer he has a lot of say too and he liked the one we chose in the end too yeah so. so good it's actually a really good tool for when we're working with with different collectors where it, it almost feels like um like you're going really beyond the screen or be beyond just showing images on the internet but you're really physically like here's a catalog of what can be done really like help stir the imagination of how they, they have a very tangible sense of what mm. it's going to be, which is, which is That's, a big part of that. Yeah, and I like books. I, I collect photo books and art books and everything. So I thought it was just a cool idea to have my own as well. And like, and now it's sold all around the world. Oh, so it's cool. have someone that has the book right there. Oh. I like it. Uh, the fans that. Yeah, it's, and it's selling still well enough and even though with coronavirus it sort of slowed down the international stuff but it's all right so i don't i, I think there's less art book fairs happening as well so that doesn't help just like every art fair is canceled well actually let, let's talk about coronavirus because it's, it's something that we're all living in our own yeah. corner of the the world and um so how is that how is that impacting because in i mean 
Sydney, Australia is, is, have, is having a very different experience than we are having in, in Montreal that's having a really dis different experience than what, say, Kyle is, Kyle Austin is living in, uh, in the U.S. And so how, what's happening for you in Australia? Uh, for me, luckily, Sydney is not too bad. But Australia in general has gotten worse because of Melbourne has become really bad. And now they're in lockdown, like serious lockdown for about six weeks right now where they can't leave their house for more than an hour a day. Like it got really bad. And Sydney is having little small clusters, but nothing that they're making us locked down again for, which is very nice. And so we're, we kind of feel like we're in this nice little safe bubble and we can't leave really anywhere, but we're just all kind of living with it and keep going. So It's, it's certainly been like a very, particular experience that I don't think that any of us ever expected to to live in our in our lifetime um how how would you say that that affects your your photo shoots because for a while you you weren't I mean traveling is such a big part of your artwork how how does that change once you're literally stuck at home well uh I guess because I originally I had planned on doing a shoot in Sydney this year and like working on a project for Sydney I was able to um, get some work done because Australia never had like a strict lockdown per se or I maybe blurred the lines of it at least and went on walks to work on my photos and I was, so I kind of does work and exercise and no one really stopped me except for once and I was in like a really busy area but other than that, so it's been kind of worth it because I want to do the project here this year anyway. So it didn't really affect my photo plans too much. But yeah, I like being able to travel and take photos and it's just seeing different cities. So that's the only thing that kind of bums me out. So. Yes, possible. Yeah. Wait, you're on mute. I was going to say, with all this free time that you've had because of being in the coronavirus bubble, have you gone back through all of your old archives and uh, sorted through all of these photographs that you have in a different way? And you've had more, uh, you found more gold in the, in the treasure trove, if you will? Uh, yeah, I've gone through some older ones, more typical travel photos, not really as much my typical work. Like I. Yeah, I guess, I don't know, I have so many archives that I realized I hadn't even used. Like, when I did the book, I used work that I still don't think I posted some of them on Instagram. It's just, I end up with way too much to share all the time. So it's, yeah. I'm, but I think because I'm working on this new project, I'm thinking more ahead than behind. And like, I haven't shared any of those images because I'm still shooting. But yeah, I just think I'd rather keep going forward with what I have. <laughs> yes, Joanne? Hmm? Yes. No, I have a question. Can you tell us a little bit about your process when you decide that you're, um, I don't know, I take it, you like urban settings. So <clears throat> when you get in, into the city, do you meander along? Do you have a small area that you want to cover? Because your things are so, so precise. Um, do you watch where you're going when you walk? I don't know. <laughs> do you just look up or? <laughs> I want to know. Tell me. Uh, I do wander kind of aimlessly. I'm very just random. And I when I get to a city, I kind of just, I don't pick a particular area. I kind of just start wherever, like from the hotel. Unless, or if, like when I'm traveling, I go, like say I'm going to go to a museum or something. I'll like, okay, I'll go to that area today and maybe do that suburb and just walk around. Because if I make a good day of it, I try to go six to eight hours if it's like a good weather, especially when traveling, and just shoot. And I kind of follow them where the light's heading, and because that's what I need. And if I see something good, I'll just I'll head in that direction. But I don't make too many set plans. And then this project in Sydney, I'm trying to shoot architecture based on the the beach is in the beach architecture. Ooh. So. Yeah, for this one, I kind of picked particular areas in Sydney, and then I so that was kind of nice to have parameters in like, okay, you can only really shoot within this like 1k area, so you had to make it work. So that's been a new kind of thing I'm working with and trying to figure out, and it's it was complicated, but I think I, in the end I got some stuff. So I'm trying to change my workflow with not being able to move around as much. 
Wallace? Do you, do you come to a place and say, mm, that would be great, except I better come back in three hours because the, then the light will be right? If it looks like it could be a really interesting area, I will do that, but for the most part, I don't. For the most part, like if I, if I miss it, I miss it. But like, usually if it's like a, like a more popular area or popular like building or something that feels like th that could help with like a series based on that city, yeah, I'll go back or like, I'll try again or something. More so like, yeah, cause usually if it's anything, it's the weather's bad and it's like, okay, well maybe tomorrow will be sunny and I can come back when there's sun on it. Francois, can you imagine us meandering around the city? We would get lost a thousand times. Both Francois and I have zero sense of direction. Do not put us together. We do not know where we're walking. We follow each other and we just get completely lost. Thank God for GPS. After about half an hour, I'm like, you know where you're going, right? And she's like, oh, I thought you knew you where you were going. <laughs> I use GPS all the time, even when I'm shooting, just to make sure I'm not like, yeah. So I can make sure I can get back to where I need to be. So, <laughs> a quick question for you, John. You were talking about light, and you follow the light as you go on these photo shoots and uh, these uh, long uh, escapades. What exactly? What kind of property of uh, are you looking for uh, when you're taking your shots with the light? Specifically about the light. Uh, I guess just the way the light's hitting it and how the shadows are kind of forming with the the materials of the building, like what kind of interesting shapes and patterns that that makes. So usually if it looks like it's more, I guess, a harder light on the building, it's, that's kind of the ones I head towards because I know there'll be a bit stronger shadows. So you're talking more like in the afternoon. Yeah, like so 10 to two is usually like my perfect time of shooting, like which is most photographers hate, but I, that's like perfect for me. It's, it's easy and then, like I don't have to get up too early then either, so I can <laughs> wait around and so it's good. And like I've been yeah, shooting now the like winter light, so it's been I have less time to shoot, so I only have to put my like but it's kind of nice because then it's it's like strong like for three hours a day, so I know that. And it's I can have a shorter day of shooting. Um we have a question from James and he says you said that you're working on new projects. Um, how do you come up with a project or theme or subject? Uh, I guess I just think a lot. I've been wanting to do this one on Sydney for a while just because I, it's like I've been trying, I guess, I guess my idea right now is I did the book and my overall work was about the idea of my process and the way I see. And then now I'm trying to do maybe more on specific cities and areas and trying to capture their essence in the minimal abstract way. So the first one I want to do is Sydney. And then since being an American or a tourist, um, most people recognize Sydney through the beaches and it's very historical and been documented in art history here. So I thought, why not try it? And then, um, yeah, like, and that's marketable too. Like it's, it's just what people like. So I thought, okay, let me try it in my way. And then other projects, I guess, like, I want to do one in Tokyo, you know, it's been shot to death just because I love Tokyo and then maybe do one in Los Angeles or Detroit just because they're the cities that I guess have connection to me. So that's how I've thought about future projects. And so right now, actually, your titles, they'll, they'll say something, uh, I mean, like blue, pink and yeah. yellow. And then that's that. So is the, are you telling me that the next series is going to be like Bondi Beach, super sellable title type of thing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I've been advised by a lot of people that I need to put more of the location in the title. And then, yeah, I think when you're doing it on one city, you can just, because the other one, everything was from all over the place. I think I wanted to make a bit of anonymity. But uh, yeah, this one, I think, why not put the sellable title <laughs> Well, and I think that giving people a location is funny because on your on your Instagram when you're saying, "Hey, this is this is Tokyo," or and then suddenly I feel transported there. I'm like, "This is absolutely a great pink and white color of Tokyo." Wow, this makes so much sense. Like it feeds the imagination in in a way perhaps that um, great pink and yellow just on their own like wouldn't. I know that I'm always creating like 
like stories to to your work where I'm like, I wonder if I've seen that corner. I wonder if like I would be passing by and I would notice their their subtleties. And then when I I saw your stories of the making of, it made me realize, no, I would have not seen any of this. <laughs> so, yeah, the next title. If anything, I might keep the color title with it in like parentheses, but the main title will be the suburb it was shot in. So. Um, and it was it was interesting receiving the the new works because we have one of the um, one of the new pieces that's titled um, Three Shades of Blue, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. And once you see that that image in person, you realize that the colors are not just three shades of blue. There's there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of textures. There's some slight clouds. There's just I was actually really surprised of all the different shades that 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 I did see in, in the actual work. So, and when I saw it, it made me realize how little Photoshop is actually probably involved in your work. So Photoshop is something that we get asked about all the time. So please tell us more about how much or how little you Photoshop your work. Oh, I, I'd use Photoshop, of course, and I use Lightroom, but like the composition, I try to get in camera and get all that as straight and as perfect. But then the verticals, and the horizontals are readjusted in Photoshop. And then depending on certain imagery, I'll clean up dirt spouches, dirt patches and such just to make it a little more clean. But, and then maybe punch the lighting up even more. But like I try overexposing as much as possible in camera. So I don't have to do as much of that just to get that contrast up. And then try to like, sometimes if it's a certain time of day, it'll be a bit warmer in the light. And so I try to then take it back to what the original colors would be like get rid of that warmth and try to make it more flat and true to color so i have to adjust that a bit and then but i try not to do too much and then i guess when i do printing i do a bit of another pass which adds a bit of sharpening and just chris makes everything very crisp for prints so it seems like it doesn't take as long but it takes longer than it, it takes me longer than i ever expect so for, but yeah is, is this a question that you have to confront often about Photoshop with pictures? Because uh, Emily and I in the gallery, I would say that, uh, you know, seven out of 10 people, eight out of 10 people who come by, that's one of the first things that they ask. And uh, I mean, we're obviously very comfortable with the idea that it's a tool that an artist is going to use and I can put a thousand people in front of Photoshop and one person's going to be a wizard. Uh, so how do, how, do, how do you feel that this question comes up? Do you find that it uh, changes the value of your work in any way? No, I don't think it does just because it, like, it comes up, everyone asks. Just I think because more people think my work is a collage and that's why I get the question. They think I like take four or five images and somehow take an element from each one and collage it together. So it's, which is, that's fine, but I'm, that's just what's popular now, but I don't, yeah, I definitely don't do that. I try to, I definitely see what I see and then maybe I'll clean it up a bit, but I, tr I definitely, yeah. And then, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess it'll just always be there and just always something I have to answer, which is fine with me. Like, cause I do use it. So I can't deny that I use it. It's just, I think I use it differently than what people expect. Yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting because I remember when we had um, a photographer come to the gallery to shoot the space and just casually i'm a chit chatter as you guys can tell and so i'm just i was asking him, what's your favorite piece in the gallery blah 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 and so he's he posted one of your photos actually the one that's behind francois and he's like this is my favorite one and so i'm like oh is it because he's also a photographer so you feel a connection and he was like what do you mean that's photography and he went up and he's like i don't think that's photography and like because the texture on that piece i mean uh, this is really not the right setting to prove my point, but I assure you the texture on that piece does not feel like it's a flat surface. It's just like it's perfection. Um, so do you, do you find like, how do other photographers react to your work? Uh, yeah, other photographers think it's great. They think it's something <laughs> different and a bit abstract and they, yeah, they, they don't, like I know there's a community of us that kind of do similar work on Instagram that we all know, but ones that don't do what I do, they all are really interested with it and kind of trying to figure out how it's photographs and stuff. So I like that. And so, yeah. Uh, as you've been, you travel a lot. 
we, we, have, we have been following you for a long time now and uh, we're constantly amazed at how much uh, you travel the globe. Uh, is there a, a city that you have found to be particularly inspiring uh, in your travels that you're like, wow, that city is just perfect for what I want to do. It has all the right angles, the perfect light. Uh, the, the best place would still be, even though a lot of people shoot it, would be Los Angeles and like that area of Southern California, just because I also have the light that is like consistent like Sydney. I'm liking Sydney more now that I've done this series. Like I, I used to shoot it when I first began photography, but right in this new series, I've kind of got a new like understanding of it and liking what the structures are and finding a way to shoot it. And then I guess I've liked going to Tokyo because it's like a lot more monochromatic, but it's also really like, and everything is just perfectly aligned. So it's not, it's like easy to find shots and it's just, maybe it's not as colorful, but I think that's just, that's the palette of Tokyo. So, and that's just what it is. So. And so like, I always think of photography as, as a little bit of a, um, a, a lonely sort of venture where you're walking with your camera and discovering what you have to discover. But if I'm not mistaken, the series that you're working on now, you're, you're working um, side by side. You're not collaborating, but you're, you're shooting sometimes with some friends who are also photographers and you're being inspired by the same places, but with completely different results. Is that something that you do often? Did I just make this up? You let me know. Uh, I do go out with some people when I can, like this project, I didn't really go out with anybody just because you weren't really allowed to. So like, I am now starting to go back out with people and shooting, but more just for fun. But I do like to go out with people when possible. I just have to find the right person because I'm, I stop very suddenly when I see something, I just will stop and mid conversation of no matter what I'm like, okay. And then I'll run and catch up with the person. So some people don't like that. And so some people, do. And I just got to find, I found a couple people here that are fine with it and they kind of love it. And so, so, but this, the last project in coronavirus, I had to go out by myself because you're not allowed to. So. I think it makes me think a little bit of how like people are always surprised if they go to the museum with Francois and I, like we can just zoom through a room. We'll just stop when something like really catches us. We don't feel like, you know, there's people who feel like when they're going to a museum or they're doing any type of sightseeing to really like take a piece in, see the <laughs> of every piece, love it for what it is. Whereas like, we're like, no, zoom, 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 zoom. Oh, this one I love. And then we're going to take the yeah. moment. It sounds like you, you shoot the way that we travel through museums. Oh, I travel through museums a bit like that too. But yeah, I, I think that's that is how I shoot. Like I'll just keep walking and I'll, I always, I take everything and that's how I try to like piece together. Like, all right, well, I've seen that material a lot. So maybe I'll try to get a shot with something like that. But that color is, I try to figure out the color palette of the city as much as possible and like, that's the new way of looking at the place. Like, okay, what colors seem to pop up more? And then I try to create images with those colors and stuff. So I can have that bit more of a feeling for that place. So I may not shoot everything, but yeah, I take it all in. Where's the first place you're going to go when you can, when you can travel again? Depending on where, if I'm allowed to or how it still is, but I would go, probably go back home go see like America, go see some family and friends there. Or I'd go to Hong Kong or Tokyo just because I was supposed to go to Hong Kong and work on another project I started last year there. So I sort of want to keep going with that. So that'd be my other place. You actually mentioned four different cities saying that they both had a personal co uh, connection to, to you. So I, I've um, Sydney, I get, and then Tokyo, I, I get because you you photograph there often. But so, what's happening in California and what's happening in Detroit? Ah, well, I guess I have a lot of friends in California, so whenever we I go there, I stop there for a long time, and that's sort of what also helped my growth as a photographer. So, we're going doing Sydney and LA a lot. I had that consistent light, so I think that helped figure out okay, this is the light that my work is created in, and then Detroit, that's where I'm from. So I thought. I'd like to one day do a series based on Detroit. Again, like Montreal, I would have to go for like three months in the summer to do it because there's no light except for in the summer. But, uh, and 
I don't know. Detroit has this weird. Most projects are really about the dilapidated, rundown parts of it. So I think I'd like to create a more upbeat series one day on it. So. It's true because I think that every city has like we sort of imagine or we just perceive of this is what that city is like, and and mm. Detroit has all of that stigma, and it would be incredible to just experience it in a completely different way. And there's so many different layers and colors. I feel like it could be really, really interesting. It'll be yeah. Fun. yeah, that's a down the road project, but that's on the list. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, Paul. Uh, one of the things is uh, that we confront as an art de or as art dealers is um, people who let's say are new to art uh, don't find that photography is a, uh, a traditional uh, thing to invest in when it comes to buying a piece of art because they want, you know, paint on a canvas. Uh, that's what they're looking for. Uh, whereas you're going to have photography in the auction markets now that are getting up to, uh, you know, three or four million dollars with Richard Prince and St. Sherman. Um, so this is uh, something that we have to deal with as uh, art dealers that, uh, you know, is that really a piece of art? Uh, what would you say to, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's new to art and like at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you want to have them interested, you want to give them an insightful answer. What would you say to somebody like that uh, who were to ask a question like that? Um, yeah, that's a tough question because I think this has gone on in waves in art history of photography being not considered as artistic and and then that time with Cindy Sherman in the 80s, it sort of became an art form again. And then I think because of Instagram and phone photography, I think it's sort of dipped again. People are thinking, oh, I can shoot that. So it's not really art or why would I pay thousands of dollars for that? Because it can be reproduced and all that. And I guess you just try to explain to them how it's you're doing very limited runs and it's like it's there's like not many available. So that's why you, you pay this price. and. It's just like any art, you kind of hope you see the artist kind of grow and hope one day it could be worth something if you really want it. But again, you also buy a piece of art because you love it. That's really what I always think. Like, yeah. And it's like, if you want it on your wall or not. And so it's like, do you like this photograph or do you like the painting? It's kind of your choice. And I don't know. And I've been dealing with a couple of my friends here that got stuck here from New York and they've been advising me and they're like saying, let's do maybe even next time do even smaller print runs just to maybe make it more like people want it more because there's less of it to, so maybe people will be more interested and the demand will go up so i don't know it's it's, it's a tough question are you are you painting at all are you sculpting at all are you creating anything else or, or are you just strictly sticking with uh, uh photography in your artistic practice uh for now yeah and maybe i'll do i do some sketching like my old type of stuff but i don't really do like any big paintings or sculptors and I've been trying to maybe just play around with some video stuff and just, I think I've been expanding my photography just in a more commercial sense, just to, just cause it's something to do. And I've noticed it, maybe do more traditional travel photos along with this stuff, just to, just to play around and like, I guess, yeah, expand how I see and what I can do with the camera. Uh, it seems that Wallace has an excellent question here. Is, uh, how do you decide which photograph you're going to print and exhibit? So I, I'm imagining that you come, uh, you've got uh, the what is it, terabytes of photographs. Uh, how, how do you pick what? First of all, what you're going to put on Instagram, but also what you're going to end up printing and putting in the walls of the galleries that represent you. Yeah, that's uh, that's the hardest part, I think. That's especially uh, like. But this last project, I think I can I made it quite big just because it was like my first one, just to play around. But um, the new process is here. I think I have like you know, this is a big pile of like prints and such that I print out on my computer or on my printer, and um, they're just about A4 size, eight by tens, and I just lay them on the floor and figure out what kind of works together and what doesn't, and then slowly edit down from there and like I think this beach project I'm trying to go for maybe 20 images and I think this pile right now is still at 100 so I got a ways to go and yes that's that's definitely the most challenging part for me of what I want to print and then even from there once you go do a test print to see if it even works to the size you want 
And if that doesn't, okay, well then that image is out and you got to find something to replace it. And it's just, it's just a long process that I'll probably be starting maybe in another month or so trying to get talking to my printer and figure out what works and what well, size I'm going to go. And the idea of test printing is something that actually I, I never really thought about because to me, like the, the, the photo arrives to me and I'm, and I'm happy and I, find, I give it a happy home and, and I, my jo job is done. But recently we were, we were, we were making a, a sale for a quite a large photograph and, um, and the artist told me, oh, I need to test print to be sure that I can make that size. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, to me, this is a, this is a done deal. Like, I've already, like, we already agreed to the measurements. And she was saying, no, no, don't worry. She's like, it's part of the process. So the idea of test printing, like, now I realize how important that actually is to, it's not just like, yes, it's going to look great big. Yes, it's going to look great small. Like, those test prints are super important. Yeah, I've been learning a bit of that. Like, I try to, like, set my sizes up for each image before I would send them to you just so I know that in case yeah. someone buys them, like, okay, no, it looks good. But um, I, some people have told me that they like my work in that smaller size and then some people like it big. So I think for this project, because I've switched cameras and I'm using a, the Hasselblad now and like I'm doing it to get bigger file sizes and depth and clarity. I'm not sure how big I'm going to go yet because like I want to go really big, but then some people like it small. So if anything, I'll go have to do two test prints of different sizes and see what I can, what works best. That's not what she said. So we have two questions here and one is from James. So I wonder if James is a photographer because it's a very specific question and it says, do you use a light meter when shooting a project or you do you just rely on the camera meter? Uh, I just rely on the camera meter because it's natural light. If I was going to use like you know, doing more studio stuff, I think I would use a light meter just to figure out what works best with the on like the, the strobe lights and all that. But outside it's just camera meter. And I think I've, for this type of work, I sort of know my settings by now. I've kind of figured it out and I shoot mainly around like F11 or up just to get um, everything as much in focus. And then I try to make sure cause I'm doing it all handheld that the shutter speed is fast enough that I can get it in focus. And then, yeah, it's usually like ISO 400 or less just cause it's in the sun. So just to get that crisp. I don't know what that really means. And that, that's all <laughs> the simple camera settings and the three things you need in all cameras. Yeah, but James, James, give us a thumbs up if that answers your, your question and if the 11 setting is a good one for you too. Um, we have another question from Doug that says, what for you is the appeal with photography? Which is actually a really good question. Yeah, uh, I guess the appeal for me is it's my way of kind of understanding the places I go. I kind of use the camera to kind of get used to a place because if I'm just walking around and like taking it in, but somehow the camera makes me feel more grounded. And so like, I don't know, I'm like kind of just a fly on the wall instead of just every being everywhere. So I just, yeah, I like, yeah, I used to, wasn't sure about that question, but I think now, especially in coronavirus time, I've been using it as a way to get out and like just enjoy myself and so I really think the camera is part of me now. <laughs> and like, I feel weird without it. Well, and, and I think that coronavirus, like we can't help but, but bring it up again, just because it's such a, it's, it's sort of an all encompassing thing. And I think that for the majority of our artists, they going through your, to your studio or going out shooting is, these are all things that can be done through through these really strange times. Yeah, it's it's a strange time to be out there, but um because I was able to go out, I could shoot my typical stuff and I was kinda like I didn't do much of practicing in like a studio. I'm now doing some studio work on the weekends just to play around, but I think cause we had like because Australia wasn't as Lockdown as everybody else. I, I didn't have to change my workflow too much. I saw in your stories that you're actually like dabbling with like fashion photography. Yeah, that's what I'm my course is more like, yeah, it's more like studio lighting and just because like, that's the way I'm trying to expand my learning is just 
play around with more photography and see, you never know, maybe I can somehow make some minimalist background, something with a model, you never know down the road. Well, and I think that that's, that's so awesome because there's so many fields of, of study, like say you're a lawyer, you're a doctor where that, that extra education, it's something that you have to keep on adding throughout your career. It's never, okay, you know what you know, now go about your business and you'll be fine for the rest of your career. It's really like you keep educating yourself, you keep on top of what's new and, and, and what's like to just stay up to date within your field. And when I saw that you were actually taking classes and there was fashion mm. photography, I was like, that's amazing. Because I think there's a lot of artists who say, okay, I found my style, I'm content and stay there. And what I love about our roster of artists is there's always um, an evolution and experimentation. And even though perhaps the result will stay very much in the same energy, there's just like that, that desire to to create push forward that I that I love about go go ask our gallery. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Autumn and who says, "How did you define the style of photography that you've ended up with? What's the draw of this style in particular? And do you worry that you will one day want to diversify?" Ooh, it's in keeping with what I just said. Uh, um, I found it because when I started Instagram, I was doing more traditional travel photos. And at that time, I just, it just wasn't to my liking. I've grown to like it more now, but, um, so I was doing more urban style. Like I still post some of what I like to shoot, like stairs and hard light and just a bit of the opposite of what everyone else was taking. And then I guess as I started my masters and researching other photographers, I just kind of, and painters and everything, I just sort of devolved, uh, yeah, developed into, something like it is now and i just i think because i didn't want to be like everyone else i kept going more minimal and minimal and minimal and then i just yeah it just sort of became what it is over time and like but now as i said now i'm gonna try to do a bit more somehow fit what i do with also growing into other styles of photography like working with minimal trying to find these minimal backgrounds and maybe putting a model in there and doing some shoots or uh i don't know i have some still life ideas and some other stuff i want to do with like minimal aspects but maybe it's like in the studio and like so there's things i want to do and just haven't really gone to them yet and who knows maybe it'll just be like minimalist and then one day want to be a maximal and just like yeah yeah i don't know about that because i definitely like all my project ideas are very minimal and it's, but it's just they're, they're different like i think the for my work will be minimal, but it'll be maybe not all just cities and architecture based. And even I've been trying to shoot more traditional architecture and then making like work that like is a wide shot and then maybe trying to find a minimal shot in that so I can like put the two together and who knows what that could turn into as well down the road. I feel like none of the artists on our roster are maximalists. Someone was came into the gallery this week actually and they were stating um, hey, is there anyone in your gallery that's just like a freak here that just like throws it on the canvas with no worries? And I was like, oh, that is, I feel like that's, that's, no. that's not plus one. I mean, like there's like, we're, we're art nerds and we like the intellectual process and which is one of the reasons why we really um, like your work. So we have two questions. We have Doug, they would like to see your camera again. Show oh, yeah. us. Uh, this is the Hasselblad X1D, which is a mirrorless Hasselblad with a, yeah, so it's just bigger sensor, which hopefully means better imagery and such. And so far it looks pretty good. Like the, the sharpness zoomed in looks really nice. And then this isn't the lens I normally use. This is what I've been using for the fashion course, but my normal lens on it is this giant uh, lens that can adapt, but it equals around 200 millimeters, which is what I used to use with my Sony which was my typical lens used to be a 70 to 200. So now I'm using primes. And Doug is happy. He says, wow, great. Mm -hmm. um, and James has a question that says, um, how were you able to find and connect with your gallery in the beginning? And I can, I can start answering that question. I can say, I stalked John and I asked him out on an art date, not really, but I asked him to join the gallery. But John, you can answer that question. Well, I think you found me through my friend Ben and 
I was doing the other art fair at the time and he came and he posted something on his story. And then that's when you contacted me and I didn't realize you were stalking me and like I already knew my work. So it's kind of like seemed more out of the blue for me, but it was quite nice. And then we just chatted up and then you said you were making, you guys were starting your gallery with Francois and yeah, it's all the same. It's just history now. It's been over a year now, just over a year. Galleries are you represented by? I have you guys, and then I work with the Gallery Minimal in Berlin, so that's two. Okay. Nothing in Australia yet, but again, the, I was hopefully that was part of the plan this year, I was trying to look for one here, but again, it's been a weird year. You can't really go and meet them and talk to them. They can't go to openings, and so I've been doing as many shows as possible online and what I can do. I feel like the Gallery in Berlin has like the perfect name to represent your work. Like, they win. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. Um, are... so, so the way that I discovered John I was actually I, I love to follow a number of different artists and so does Francois and both of us just we have a number of art crushes that may or may not be within our aesthetic but we just really love where you're going and um, this photographer um, was talking about John's work and saying hey this is someone that I really admire and you should check it out he wasn't saying that to me it as if it was to me and I did take it out and I I fell completely in love showed it to Francois and he was like you go butterfly and and it all worked out so we really and we all connected so it was it was amazing when when that happens because I think there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of artists and but when you find that artist that's you fall in love with their work and you look forward to that evolution it's it's um it's an amazing thing yeah, but we, we also worked well together. That's what I liked. I think I like both of you guys' personalities. And like I said, I've met some galleries here and I just didn't, they didn't feel right. And it's just, okay, well, let's just wait until you find the people that also can work together well with. The feeling's mutual. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> After that, pi pra, that pizza party, we liked you too. <laughs> yeah. um, Autumn has a question and she says, do you feel like the camera is that important in your process? I feel like the artist makes the photo and the camera is just a tool. Um, and that you could do what you're doing even with the most basic of cameras, that it's in your eye. Um, how important do you feel like upgrading your camera is? Uh, yeah, I have to agree. It's definitely all in the eye and you can shoot it with an iPhone or whatever. Cause even when I first started, I had the most basic simple Lumix camera and that's how I began. But when you want to print and you want high quality and large prints, I think that's when the camera becomes important because you want good technology that can create enough pixels and the sensor size and all that. And that's why I keep upgrading my cameras now and playing with the Hasselblad because I, I think I just want the best quality I can because I have the eye, but I just want to be able to help have the output be just as high quality. I think that's, yeah. So if you're using something small, go for it and keep learning on that. But if you want to, I think that's the only real reason you need to get a big camera is if you want to print. And, and I think, yes, Paul? Uh, just wondering, like, uh, as you were doing your masters, uh, what kind of photographers were your major influences? What, who did you really like catch on to? Uh, I really fell in love with all the German photographers, which, so it's funny because none of them shoot in the light I use, but uh, Michael Wolf, who shot all the Hong Kong like architecture and street, uh, street scenes. Uh, Thomas Struth, who did a lot of these like simple structures of New York and now cities around the world. Um, and then I looked at, I guess, a couple of Americans like Stephen Shore and such, just for the colors and everything. So my style doesn't look like theirs, but I guess they're all dealt with architecture and cities in a way. So. Well, and, and you said one thing that's really interesting where you said, yes, I do have a good eye, which I love because I'm all about self-confidence and I think it's super important. And how, how did you, when did that come about where you could say, hey, I do have a good eye and I am, I'm an artist and this is what I do. This is my career. Uh, I guess, I don't know. It's, I guess just maybe like a, even when I finished the master's, I think I realized that like, people are interested outside of Instagram into my work. And I think once I got more in the real world, people noticing it and wanting to buy it, I think that's when I figured it out. Like, okay, this is something that, I think this is sort of probably something I was meant to be doing. 
and like uh yeah just and but that's why i also want to develop my eye further and do other things because i think like yeah i've developed my eye for this and i'm confident in what i'm doing with this but i want to get confident in other aspects as well just keep growing so. love that uh, one of the things that I love to to end with is for sure I would like to take a, a group selfie. So I'll be taking a picture of our, our screen. So if everyone wants to raise their glass and look really happy, I'm going to take a picture very soon. So everyone smile. There we go. You heard it. It happened. Does yeah. anyone have any last minute questions before we, we close the evening slash morning off? Doug says, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, I'm really happy that we were able to do this. And it makes you think of this conversation with someone who's literally, for in my case, on the other side of the world. So uh, 7 p.m. here and then 90, uh, 7 p.m. here and then 9 a.m. for you. And I think that's something that's extraordinary that our technology yeah. today to do this. Thank you so yeah, much. 20 hours of plane right away. So. <laughs> Thanks for setting the alarm for us. That's good, yeah. I usually don't wake up as early on a Saturday, but it's fine. Yeah, it's good. I took, I'm, off, I'm off to my course now anyway, so I had to run to my course, so it's good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and everyone, we hope to see you for, for another Zoom. And also, you can now stop the recording. We are done. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye.